Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is the first event in this series. My name is Lucy Handley. I do adult programs at the Ridgefield Library, and I'm going to introduce Barb Jenis, our poet laureate from Ridgefield, who's a retired public school educator who leads workshops and curates readings for the Ridgefield Library, the Aldrich Museum, the Connecticut Poetry Society, plus many area churches and schools. Barb's poems have appeared widely in literary journals and anthologies. Her collection, Blinded Birds, received the 2022 International Book Award for a poetry chapbook, and her poem, Glyphs of a Gentle Going, was recently awarded the 2022 Lesko Prize. Welcome, Barb. Take it away. Oh, thank you, Lucy. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And also thank you, um, Ridgefield Library, for hosting us so, so graciously. Um, as Lucy said, welcome to the inaugural episode of Poems from Connecticut's Four Corners. Um, I am, as, as mentioned, Barb Jenis, the current, although soon, emerita poet laureate of Bridgefield. Um, I'll talk a little bit more, more about that later. Um, we're delighted and really, really honored to bring you, our friends and viewers, a sampler of Connecticut poetry. On the first Wednesday evening of each month, we'll host five poets here on Zoom one from each of Connecticut's four corners, plus a fifth from the central Hart Hartford area. Uh, best of all, the series will showcase both award-winning established poets like those we have with us tonight, plus some of the state's finest and most interesting emerging poets. Tonight, we break from that format uh, to bring you three very established, esteemed poets from the central Hartford area, uh, West Hartford to be precise, our guest poets this evening are Ginny Lowe Connors, Christine Beck, and Benjamin S. Grossberg. Uh, familiar names to many of you joining us tonight, I'm sure. Uh, each poet will read for 15 or 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll invite you to submit questions for them by clicking on the, uh, the, the uh, chat button um, on your Zoom screen. Just a quick note before we get started, um, a couple of upcoming events. Uh, one, this Sunday, January 8th, the library is also hosting a free online workshop titled Get Those Poems Published. Um, it's a two hour how to on submitting your poems to literary journals and anthologies with the aim of getting them into print in 2023. Um, topics covered will include where to find information on contests and journals uh, that are open to submissions, proper formatting of poems for submission, evaluating where your work is best suited and most apt to be accepted, keeping records of your poems, of where you've sent them uh, and when, and then submission etiquette. There is, believe it or not, submission etiquette. And you can register at the link. I'll, I'll be popping into the chat in a few seconds. Another brief announcement about something I alluded to a moment ago. Richfield is currently accepting applications for the next um, Richfield Poet Laureate, um, whose term will run from April of this year to March of 2026. If you're a Richfield poet, and would like to apply, please visit the Ridgefield Library website. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's an amazing opportunity uh, for anyone who, who wants to share that love of poetry with the Ridgefield community. I've had a blast. It's been a really wonderful three-year ride. So let's get down to business with our, with our poets for this evening. Um, let's see. We're going to start with Christine Beck. Christine uh, Beck is a poet and writer of creative nonfiction. She holds an MFA in creative writing and has taught creative writing at local universities. Christine was formerly poet laureate of the town of West Hartford. Her po poetry collections include Blinding Light from Grayson Books, I'm Dating Myself from Dancing Girl Press, and Stirred Not Shaken from Four Way Books. Christine is also the author of Beneath the Steps, a, poetry, uh, a book of poetry and poetry prompts for people in 12-step programs. And I'll, I'll put her bio and also her, her website link in the chat. So welcome, Christine. Thank you so much, Barb. And thank all of you for being here. Uh, without you, I'd be talking to myself. So this is a wonderful <laughs> opportunity. Uh, although I do talk to myself a fair amount, actually, and it works out really well. Um, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be reading this evening with uh, Jenny Connors and Ben Grosberg. Um, our ties go back for many, many years um, in many different ways. And it's just exciting to be, um, to be on the same platform with the two of them, uh, both poets that I esteem uh, very highly. 
So um, I'm going to be reading eight poems this evening. And the poems that I'm going to read are all in a, a current collection I'm working on called The Spirit Catches You. Uh, they're designed to braid together a little bit of narrative, that is to say a little bit of a story, uh, some philosophical questions, so some kind of meditation about uh, something uh, of, of substance. And also, I hope, they connect in in some way with the experience of being human. Uh, because for me, the poems that I remember and go back to again and again are those that really catch me as embodying something essential about the experience of being human. So I'm going to begin with a poem called um, In the Desert. And um, this, just, uh, this, this poem just kind of came to me, but the conceit of it is we're in the desert and there's a lot of nothingness, right? There's sand, uh, there's a deserted shack, and then there's a meditation about what could be in this place where there appears to be nothing. So it's called In the Desert. Since there's only sand and tumble brush, no driveway, no address, forget your GPS. Since there's no front door, no need to knock, no bell to ring, since no one knows you're here, walk right in. Since there's no yard, no flowers, grass, or trees, no prairie dogs, no red-tailed hawks, let your ears attune to bees. Since it's deserted, Make it a home for harbingers, the dead, who rustle in the underbrush, their words tuned to the wind, impossible to understand. Gaze out from broken windows. Let your eyes adjust to lonely. Let your hair tangle in the breeze. Let your spirit thrum and wrestle. Hang it from the eaves. So that's in the desert. And as I mentioned to you, I love questions. Um, and I love poetry that poses lots of questions. Um, you know, um, we've been told, oh, don't ask a question if you're not gonna answer it, or there are too many questions in this. As far as I'm concerned, there can't be too many questions. So this is called, Some Questions You Might Ask About the Universe. How many football fields, jelly beans, motes of starlight, to get from here, right here, to the crisp edge of the universe, burned like cookies on a metal tray. And where is there? Do astrophysicists know something they aren't saying? Do they show up daily at the lab, shrug on their white coats, power up the cyclotron, then step outside for a coffee or a smoke, bask on sunny steps? run their fingers through their trusty spaniel's fur, having concluded that the question is unsolvable. Or maybe the solution is too terrible to contemplate. Maybe they have found the edge. Maybe they have proved the ancients were correct. The universe is flat as Kansas. Maybe they have peered into a roiling pit like a slash of dark from a childhood closet left ajar, a void, choked up with Coke cans, Walmart bags, plastic straws, and a goblet of dirty diapers. Maybe they already know there is no coffee there, no sunshine, and definitely no spaniels some questions you might ask about the universe. The next poem is in response to a poem written by Mary Oliver, whom many of us know. She loved questions and she had a poem called Some Questions You Might Ask. Mary Oliver wrote a book of essays, I believe it's called Blue Pasture, or Blue Pasturers, and in it she uh, revealed that as a child uh, she was abused by her father and she didn't want to go to school. And she would take a book of poems by Walt Whitman and she would hide out in the woods. She'd take Walt Whitman with her out into the woods and she'd hide out from, uh, from the torment that was going on in her home. And so I, I took that idea with me 
And as you know, I, I've mentioned I love to work with ideas. So I, um, I also picked up a part of what, one of Walt Whitman's poems where he talks about um, the universe, talks about um, uh, a, a filament, a spider's filament of holding the universe together. So this poem is called, Since You Asked. In response to Mary Oliver, some questions you might ask. You ask about the soul, who has one, and where to look for it. You, dead since January, turned into atoms, particles you were fond of attributing to Lucretius' theory of nothingness transformed to everything. I want to tell you, I've seen the owl in the barn. I've pulled apart the neat packets of mouse bones it could not digest. Does the owl have a soul? What about the mouse? But come to think about it, what about the barn? I know you read Whitman. Your comfort in the woods when you cut school, safe from the tormentor in your house. Whitman wondered too about the soul, whether it could be reached by a filament spun out by noiseless patient spiders. If those particles drift down to form the stones, these stones, the ones you and I are looking at right now, if a stone can have a soul, then I ask you, what about your tormentor? Did he have one too? That's from Mary Oliver. And speaking of stones, years ago, at a shop in West Hartford Center, I think it's still there, called 10,000 Villages. I fell in love with the sculpture. Um, it was uh, made of white, what looked like marble, and it was two um, kind of interlocking arches, and it was carved from one piece of stone, which absolutely fascinated me. And so I wrote about it. It was, um, the card said that it came from Kenya. It was made in Kenya. Um, I wrote about that stone. It was called uh, a Kisi stone. And, um, and I thought about what does the stone remind me of? And what came to me is that it reminded me of, of different things depending upon when I looked at it, uh, which we know is often true with anything that's sort of abstract. So this poem is called Kisi Stone. I gaze at treasures clustered on my desk. They tantalize my eyes as I face down an empty page. My favorite is a sculpture made of kisi stone carved by a Kenyan native, according to the card. An abstract form of interlocking loops. Sometimes I see two hearts linked together. Other days, it's just a set of arches, a small one nestled in a bigger one. Perhaps its maker labored in her village square as she carved it with her kisu knife, then rubbed it to a sheen as pale as berry bones. I imagine her, this woman I will never see, as I imagine you. Sometimes my heart feels as distant from you as that foreign land. Other times we are connected like the arches of this Kisi stone, luminous, linked without a seam. So that's where the Kisi stone took me. And uh, now I'm gonna read a poem that uh, is, was inspired by my days teaching forensic evidence. Yes, I, I had a, a day job. And, um, and I learned in the course of teaching that course that, uh, which many of you probably know, that there are no straight lines in nature right, that um, everything in nature uh, is slightly uh, off kilter, I should say. So when uh, forensic scientists find a, something that's lined up exactly um, equidistant, they know that, um, that it's been placed there, that it's not natural. So that led to this other rumination um, about uh, the nature of being human, and you'll see that it works its way from CSIs to love letters. That's just what poems do sometimes. So it's called tear, don't cut. Cuts are neat, precise, symmetrical. 
there are no straight lines in nature. CSIs know this. If they find two twigs laid equidistant, someone's had a hand in it. Some things look straight in the distance, but get messy viewed up close. The horizon, say, or a mountain silvered in a summer fog, its edges and illusion, like the thought of you. To cut, you must work methodically so as not to wreck the form. Tears are jagged, leaving in their wake frazzled edges with uncertain boundaries. Why feed an old love letter to a shredder? Contemplate neat slips of passion disappearing straight in a closed container. Far better to tear it. Hear the rasping sound of loss. See, I love you. Offer up its promise to a fire in the grate. And the next poem I'm gonna read is called Call and Response. So many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the uh, conceit in poetry readings that um, I might read a poem, and let's say it's about a plum tree. And Ben would say, oh, wait a minute, I've got a poem about a, a plum tree, so I'm gonna read my plum tree poem, or I've heard it done with lightning bugs. It could be done with anything, right? But it's called Call and Response. So what I did was I took three poems by um, well-known poets, and I did my own response to them. And then I braided them together, which is one of the things I love to do in writing, to see kind of what will come out if I put it all together. So you'll hear little bits and pieces of The Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. You'll hear a little bit of um, uh, I Love You Sweatheart by Thomas Lux, one of my all time favorites and just uh, a wonderful homage to Thomas Lux who, uh, who has died way too young. And Robert Hass, who wrote a beautiful poem about a woman at a poetry retreat who, um, who had been attracted to a man and they were gonna get together and she was gonna go meet him um, at, you know, in his cottage after the reading. And then she said, there's something I need to tell you. You know, I've had a, a double mastectomy. And he said to her, I don't think I could do that. And so the next morning uh, on his porch, he finds a beautiful bowl. It's filled with rose petals. But underneath the rose petals is a bowl of dead bees. What a powerful image. So that's the Robert Hass poem. And now that I've given away my poem, <laughs> I'll read call and response. Each poem calls up a response. The red wheelbarrow calls up the red keds you wore that summer, left on the front step, waiting for the feet that didn't know where they'd go next. Or how about, I love you, sweatheart, graffitied on the overpass by a guy who couldn't keep his spray paint to himself. The sweat of lovers called up by his third grade teacher who didn't teach him how to spell. Or the one about the mastectomy with that small dish of dead bees hidden by rose petals on the would-be lover's porch. The petals clustered in a vessel too small to hold a missing breast, which calls up fingers inching up a bedroom wall, an arm whose nodes are gone, like bees climb up a wall, humming their summer song, not knowing they will end up dead on a poet's porch. That's call and response. In a lighter tone, I wanna to read a poem about crows. Ben uh, did a read reading once that I attended and every other poem he introduced, he said, this came from an article that I listened to on NPR. So Ben, this also came from Science Friday on NPR, where they talked about how clever and smart crows are. And they'd done experiments with crows and they figured out, oh my God, 
crows can recognize you. Crows know, like if you gave them food yesterday, they know who you are. And anyway, crows apparently are pretty smart, which led me to write about crows. I know you want to praise the swan. It's silken white sheen of feathers. It's effortless glide across the lake, neck extended as if its head is weightless, as if it doesn't have a thought. I know you're honoring the owl, imputed in your mind with ancient wisdom. Although, what when you come down to it is so wise about a bird that throws up bits of mouse bones after lunch? I'm not interested in the pretty or the wise. I want to talk about the crow. Black as coal dust or treachery, the crow, ungainly, rowdy as hell's angels roaring down the highway in a pack of outrage and exhaust. And it has a right to outrage, does the crow, for its cousin Raven gets all the credit. The Raven Noah sent out to find a wisp of green. The Raven Ho conscripted to proclaim love gone wrong. The Ravens perched on the lawn at the Tower of London, sharing raucous stories of heads that rolled. I love the crow because it greets the day full-throated as if it didn't care if there would be tomorrow. And now it turns out, crow is crafty. If you catch a crow, he'll remember you. He'll note your clothes, your attitude. He will tell his friends stalk you for your sins. Just this morning, as I awoke, two crows set off a ruckus, as if to say, dismiss us at your peril. We know where you live. And I wanna end with a poem that I wrote a number of years ago. Um, I read somewhere that Goethe's last words were more light, more light. And that led me to wonder, hmm, wonder what he meant by that. So here is my imagining of what Goethe might have meant by more light. And it's called Last Words. At his last, Goethe pled more light, more light, then shuddered up his musings, left the living to consider what he meant. Some thought he glimpsed the golden light of afterlife Others thought it was his epitaph, instructions for remembrance of the grave philosopher. Perhaps it was a cosmic joke, as if he knew he'd spark a scrabbling for enlightenment in garrets of undergraduates, desperate to hitch their slender underpinnings to a star beyond their grasp. More light when many die with mother on their lips. The one they had, the one they wished for, the one who lived next door, her fresh baked scent that filtered through the window sash, the broken hinges, gaping undergrowth, the one who held her body lightly as a loaf of bread, its smooth outer skin, soft inner yielding, its dailiness as simple as a dying man lying in the dark who wished to see once more the daylight streaming in its sustenance. Thank you everyone for listening. Wonderful, Christine. Oh my gosh, wonderful. I, I especially love the poem about crows. I'm a big crow fan. I feed them peanuts and um, they know, they do know you and they know exactly where my bedroom window is and I dare not oversleep, but anyway, wonderful, wonderful. You have a wonderful reading voice too. So thank you for sharing your work. Thank you. Next up, we have um, Benjamin S. Grossberg, whose latest book, My Husband Wood, was the uh, winner of the 2021 Connecticut Book Award. And it's a stiff competition. I know several books that were in that and they're all, they were all wonderful. Um, his earlier books include Space Traveler and Sweet Core Orchard, winner of the 2009 Lambda Literary Award for Poetry. All three books were published by the University of Tampa Press. 
Ben's work has appeared widely, including in the Pushcart Prize and Best American Poetry Anthologies. As our right fit, uh, a chapbook of poems about the passing of Ben's mother will be published by Harbor Editions in 2023. This past fall, Ben was a featured poet at the Dodge Poetry Festival, and he is the poet laureate, not only, well, he's poet laureate of West Hartford, and not only that, but he's the director of creative writing at the University of Hartford. So please welcome Ben Grossberg. Um, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to, to be here, to be reading with, um, um, with Ginny and Christine. Um, and thank you guys all for, for coming to listen. Uh, I'm going to share some poems from that chapbook um, that Barb mentioned. Thank you, Barb, for inviting us um, as our right fit. It's a strange title. It's actually from a quote from King Lear. Uh, Cordelia tells her father, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as our right fit. Uh, the first poem I'm going to read is called My Mother's Dying. Um, th th this, this is not going to be a kind of an up uh, reading, as you can tell. Um, my mother's dying. It is hers, and I am to have none of it. A privacy, a whisper, knees clasped to chest. A novel on a long flight on which she does not sleep while those around her do her face cupped in her hands, arms folded in, palms tight to the biceps, or chin tucked to the chest. She hears me asking for it and does not wish to be impolite. She turns her back, carrying her plate to another room, fork gentle against its porcelain. Solitary by an open window, she closes the pages of her dying when I walk in. She lets the pen of it drop, folds the paper over when I enter the kitchen, when I see her at table writing her dying. When I come to her knee as children do, she puts her hands in her pocket, brings up a mento, a plastic container that shakes out M&Ms, but I know it is in there too, her dying. Then turning, she asks if I will bring her muffins with bran, though she cannot remember the word bran, and raisins, cannot remember raisins, but wants, she says, a lot of them. I take this for what it is, a measure of flour, eggs broken one by one into a bowl, and the whisking, a parcel of her dying, the smallest she can part with. It will rise golden over foil cups. It will fill my house 200 miles north with its good smell. I will bring it back to her, her dying, and watch for a smile perhaps only because she's glad to receive it. Such a terrible thing to part with this intimacy, even to her son, even just for a few hours to her son. Um, this next poem is called Seeing Those Damn Greasy. And the whole poem is a sentence. It begins in a supermarket and it ends in a supermarket, the same one, but it travels kind of a circuitous route. So um, uh, be warned. <laughs> uh, seeing those damn greasy, day old chickens hunched, roasted and stacked in clear plastic domes in a refrigerated case by the checkout, compel of all people, God help me, my mother, who sashays over purse swinging to their rounded half-off stickers, and one by one lifts each, closely inspecting the trust browned limbs therein, sometimes bringing the plastic seam of a package right up against her nose, all the while describing much 
much too loudly how a whole chicken is dinner for two nights and what's left can be shredded from the breast for her salad that you can't go wrong not for three dollars you simply can't go wrong this was back before the diagnosis before i saw her face her lips barely differentiated grays her lying on the end of a couch tiny under afghans and realized only in retrospect realized that she was looking at me with what was really a kind of sidled wonder as if trying to account for me for how such a large busyness had emerged whole from her body and it was also before i learned as i did after she died that she had in accounts not even my father knew about money almost no calculus of parsimony could explain no daily palm sweeping off the kitchen table from among keys wallet and phone my father's change no part-time work which she did as a nurse for 20 years money enough to buy cartloads of chickens chickens prepared special whole platters of chickens fresh from the deli counter makes me want there in the shop right to retract into myself my arms electric car antenna drawing back into my sleeves my head sinking tortoise like into the shell of my torso makes me want even though i do understand theoretically that a day may come when a minute with her even one of such flaming public embarrassment will be as far from my grasp as any culture's vision of heaven makes me want right there on the spot to wink out like a soap bubble a perfect sphere of swirling color poked by a child's finger um my my mother uh god bless her soul loved uh bargains she loved uh things on sale she loved chickens that were half off she also loved going to flea markets um and this next poem is about her um at a uh, flea market it is called uh the wedgwood the watches wedgwood didn't matter she says speaking to me in a dream the little vases and ashtrays the boxes littering the houses i ask they didn't matter no she says swirling ice cubes in a tumbler of vodka no though haggling for them at yard sales watching people wrap them in newspaper then shoving them so wrapped into my purse that mattered she takes a drag on her cigarette like she used to at bingo when i was five six seven years old and she sat across from me smoking cigarette after cigarette to the drone of numbers in a hall so dense with smoke you couldn't make out blue hairs five seats away what about watches i ask knowing my mother's predilection for watches a hamilton she'd cry a seiko it still works winding its gear between the long nails of her thumb and forefinger and thrusting it right up against the side of my head so i could hear the tick watches she says now so ghostly in my dream that she flickers as hazy and insubstantial as cigarette smoke smoke generating smoke didn't mean shit she says slicing the air with the edge of her palm like she did when i was alive her face her jaw set firm but showing you showing dad the watch after i came home from the auction holding it out and watching for the tick to register in your eyes that she says then she mentions dad how he snatched the watch from her hand that hold it up high and say it ticks it ticks she got a real bargain a real matzia a hamilton that ticks then he'd parade around the kitchen a little do a kind of strut and she would grab the watch back from his hand and strap it on her wrist and wear it the rest of the day and say i know i know as if there wasn't any irony in his pronouncement and who knows maybe there wasn't 
That, she says, mattered. And now, because it's a dream, she grabs my wrist and zap. We're in the house where he still lives, watching him bend over a drawer with nine or ten Seikos and Hamiltons, with his forefinger stirring them around as if they were morsels of frying meat. He's speaking in a low voice. She liked watches, your mother. So I ask her, if the watches don't matter, but this matters, doesn't that mean that the watches matter? She twirls her tumbler, and we look up from the kitchen counter at my dad, who continues explaining about the watches. But soon, all we hear is the ticking of out of sync gears. Tick, tick, tick. Um, something forced. Something forced the amaryllis bulb. That's the verb we use, forced it. Its petals just one shade more pleasing than blood. Do I mention the year it lay dormant or the spears thin green arrowheads, their announcement? Why not? My mother's exhalation beneath the pot, her ghostly avatar opening its chalk line of a mouth, expelling what was once breath into the bulb's white fist, coaxing it open. And Dan, two dates in, loved me, briefly. Why not her entering him too, parting his shoulder blades like curtains? reaching a vapor hand, finding and soothing the contours of his heart like water over clay, making slip, that's the word, clay and its diluted self, rounded, softening edges. The week he loved me was good. If my mother's soul couldn't do more than that, well, she got the vessel turning. It wasn't unreasonable to expect me to do the rest. What the cat sees in her cat staring, something, certainly, don't you, cat? Or hears, one ear rotating outward, body otherwise still in a still room. If I don't move, not even a breath, that balance keeps everything still, but whisker and soul dragging the gray lace of itself across hardwood floors. When I told my mother I'd brought acreage out in Ohio, she raised an eyebrow and said, I can't see you as much of a farmer. I guess we never had much faith in each other. How can you see me, Ma? Hard as I try, I can't see her as a soul not some white transparency brushing my cheeks. Silly me thinking it the new salve, metrogel, finally clearing up the rosacea she and I shared on our similar faces. Anyway, why would she look so closely after me in death when in life she never had, when all she'd done, and in a selfish way, a mostly selfish way, was love me. Um, I'm gonna uh, close with uh, one last poem. Um, um, this poem is about um, a necklace my mother uh, left for me um, in her, well, sort of unofficially, she didn't have a will, but uh, uh, made known uh, she left for me. And it's called, My Mother Approves. It was not evening out jewelry, not twice a year jewelry. She slept in it. She always said when she died, I would have it, but almost certainly never pictured me wearing it. How it would lie an inch below my beard in the hollow between my clavicles. How the serpentine chain would catch stray hairs on my shoulder and neck and the emerald 
bright with its corona of diamond chips, would fill the open collar of a flannel shirt over jeans, brown belt, work boots, and be, to the right kind of man, a signal, a traffic light glowing green at the most vulnerable spot on my throat. Now in death, she understands the necklace was always about drawing the eye to the flesh, a way to scoop light from the air, to make a man want to catch that light like a snowflake on his tongue. Yes, that's the word she's saying to the body most like her own once was, briefly incarnating herself in front of me to straighten the chain. My mother, like any mother, willing her child to be beautiful. Yes, it fits like that, close to the throat. Thank you. Wonderful, Ben. Oh my heavens. Just, just gorgeous poems about your mother. The, the, the line, um, when all she'd done in a selfish way, a mostly selfish way, was, was love me. Just knock the breath out of me. Beautiful work. Can't wait to get the book this year. So congratulations on that, by the way. Okay. Uh, and by the way, check the chats, Ben. You're getting lots of uh, gorgeouses and beautifuls. <laughs> so <laughs> so th thank you, everyone, for commenting, too. Um, <clears throat> last but certainly not least, we have Ginny Lowe Connors. Ginny is the author of four full-length poetry collections, the most re recent of which is Without Goodbyes, From Puritan Deerfield to Mohawk Gankawaki, um, which was from Turning, uh, Turning Point, 2021. Her chapbook, Under the Porch, won the Sunken Garden Poetry Prize, and she has earned numerous awards for individual poems. She is a former poet laureate of West Hartford, something all three of these folks, poets this evening share, although Ben is their current one. Um, a, as publisher of her own press, uh, Grace and Books, Connors has also edited a number of wonderful poetry collections, including Forgotten Women, a tribute in poetry. She is the co-editor of Connecticut River Review. Please welcome <laughs> Ginny Lowe Connor. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, uh, Richfield Library. And it's uh, such a pleasure to read with Ben and Christine, both wonderful poets, and I enjoyed listening to them tonight. I will be reading poems from that most recent book, Without Goodbyes. Um, the collection is kind of a historically based narrative with individual poems following the journey and transformation in some ways of a girl. Joanna Kellogg, who was an 11-year-old Puritan girl living in Deerfield, Massachusetts in the early 1700s, who was captured along with many others in a raid um, on Deerfield. And she and her, and two of her siblings, Joseph and Rebecca, were taken to a Mohawk village in what was then called New France, or we would call Canada. The village was Ganawaki, and um, the village included a Jesuit mission. So Joanna was adopted into a Mohawk family, and she lived there for most of the rest of her life. So although her introduction to First Nations people was highly traumatic, um, over time, she truly became part of that community. Um, and 300 years later, we are still struggling with concepts of us versus them. But when we come into intimate contact with the other, those boundaries seem to dissolve. And that's one of the reasons I think her story is still relevant. So I'll read a few uh, poems from that book. Um, in the first poem, which is the first poem in the book, there's the word savage is used, and I know that's an offensive term, but I'm sure at that point, um, that is how Joanna would have viewed 
the people who were involved in the raid, even though later on they became her loved ones. So the first poem is called Everything She Knows Goes Up in Smoke. It takes place in Deerfield Village, Massachusetts, February 29th, 1704. And a point of interest is that it was a very snowy winter that year. And although there was a palisade fence around the community, the snow piles around it made it very easy to climb over the snow piles and get into the village. Everything she knows goes up in smoke. The night before, her hands chapped and stupid, Joanna dropped a redware pitcher, watched it shatter. Her mother's flare of anger, sudden sting of a slap, her father's pinched lips. And now, this broken morning, how red the rising sun, the air so cold, already her heart is freezing. The wind shrieks, and a pig, too, galloping past them, a hatchet in its side, a savage chasing it, and a French soldier laughing like the very devil. Blood on the snow, bodies, mash of footprints everywhere, a woman's shawl whipping in the wind, some crippled thing trying to fly, flames roaring, consuming their homes, thick curdles of smoke. Its acrid smell mixes with the odor of blood, cold sweat. Can this be real? Survivors herded toward the meeting house, she among them. The men are roped like calves. Where is her father? There's Joseph, his face all smudged. Becca clutches her hand, nose running, eyes like pewter plates. Raiders strut. Push, shout, in words she doesn't know, hauling away woolens and kettles, bread and bacon and prisoners. A hundred Deerfield villagers, many of them children, like Joanna. Reverend Williams, their leading citizen, moves meekly along, his eyes tearing, lips sputtering. She tries not to cry, but cinders lodge in her eye. Crows flap and hop among the slaughtered, repeating, at, at, at. Joanna pulls her sister along, but turns to look back and sees a figure in nightclothes fleeing toward the woods, her mother abandoning them, abandoning them. So their journey, um, a journey where the prisoners were brought up to New France, was a journey of about 300 miles. Um, and it was a difficult journey, even though the, uh, the raiders were kind to the children who were part of it. This one is called A Coating of Ice. They slept in shelters made of log poles and skins as freezing rain clink clinked against the hides. But today, the sun is a bright coin tossed high and far. All the trees wear an armor of ice. Joanna blinks, half blind in all this light. Her thoughts are heavy and black. Though today, the whole world shines. It stretches out before her. Trees and snow, ice glitter, questions without answers, an emptiness coated in ice. She is no place. She is no one. Joanna Kellogg of Deerfield, brown-haired girl whose home had a fine red door, whose mother taught her the things a girl should know, whose father hummed and worked his fields, brought her outside to smell the turned soil, measure the height of their corn, that girl's lost as a dream at dawn. And her chickens with their warm eggs, they're a story one tells little children. She's been given a new name, Onikanos Ayote. Joseph, who talks to Indians as if he's forgotten, he's a white boy with a civilized tongue. Joseph says he thinks the name means white feather. 
What kind of fool name is that? Onikanos Ayoti? No. That girl Joanna? No. She is a stomach clenching. They have run out of food. Um, several days into their journey, the next poem is they see a white owl. Snow turns to slush. They keep going. Joseph, who used to run back and forth, talking, pointing, strutting, he's slowed down. Rivers to cross, mountains to climb, keep going. At dusk, a snowy owl glides overhead, a vision, a ghost, a spirit leading them on. They all pause, gaze upward. Something shifts inside Joanna. To be in this wild place with the wind carrying its pine scent, the moon rising, all notion of chores erased. It's not entirely bad, but the meat of two rabbits and a handful of beans make a thin stew. Children are given their portions first, but never enough. As darkness settles over them, Becca huddles against her sister. And Joanna feels the jut of her small shoulder blades, sharp as plow blades. Joanna and her sister are girls dressed in rags who must stumble through a wilderness. If they could fly above it all, wearing white feathers. But no. A red star throbs on the horizon, and the night feels large around them. The next poem um, takes place after they've been in the village of Ganawaki for a while. Ganawaki in the Mohawk language means place of the rapids. And it's located not far from Montreal on the St. Lawrence River. And there are cascades in that area. So um, this poem is called The Rapids. And at this point, um, in her story, Joanna will just be referred to as White Feather. The Rapids. On her stomach, beneath the curtain of willow leaves, White Feather gazes toward the rapids, where the river rowdies to a noisy white froth. Water rushes over and through this cascade. No thought of danger. Sunlight falling toward it breaks into a million glittering sparks, becoming small flames that ride the water. Yanawaki men know to portage their canoes around this part of the river. Trappers and traders hire them to do the same. But sometimes in a journey, the rapids come on unexpected. He knows this. You have to plunge through and hope to make it past the boulders and the churning. Though you don't know up from down, water from air, or where this perilous ride will take you. The next poem is called Instruction. <clears throat> forget the spinning wheel. Forget the heckling of flax. Good night. Forget the plank table you scrubbed each day, the wood grain glowing beneath your touch. The youngest boy and what was done to him, that you must forget. Your mother's back as she ran into the trees, holding her nightdress clothes, close. Forget, forget, forget. And your father's shuffling silence, his face blank, his eyes refusing to see anyone. It's something to forget. Here, the men are bold, and the women rule, open-hearted in their laughter. They hold out their arms to the young, carry their babies everywhere, safely strapped into cradle boards. There's almost no crying. There is no need for crying. The old prayers you were warned never to forget got lost on their way toward heaven or fell to the frozen earth. Words become smoke, 
promises turn to ash. Forget all the old names, except your own. Remember, Joanna. You are not that girl anymore, but you carry her with you. A person is made of skin and bones, hunger and hope, footprints and many ghosts. Come quietly to your ghosts, Joanna. Allow them to rest. Let's read a couple more. Um, so that last poem mentioned her father. Her father was captured too, as was her older um, half brother, but they were taken to a different area. The captives were split up. And the, the ones who were adopted were most likely to be children and the older people were most likely to be held and maybe eventually ransomed back for money. So this poem is about her sister. It's called Her Sister Swimming. Becca, little bird she's called now, has learned to swim. White feather watches the Ganawaki girls, Moonface, Twig, and Gray Dawn, splash her, encourage her, laugh with her. Tiny rainbows as drops go flying. Little bird emerges from the river, sleek and smiling. Stands in shadow, laughs at her almost daughter, who's learned this new thing, who's joined the other girls. Stands in shadow is so easy with the child. It doesn't scold when Little Bird runs to her, carelessly soaking her skirt. Little Bird clutches moments of happiness, greedy for them. The way she gulped down mouthfuls of stew when they first arrived, hunger the only sure thing. White Feather should be glad for her little sister, who can laugh again after all. But a meanness rises up sometimes, vile in her throat, chokes her, like smoke from wood that's green or damp. Foolish girl. Sometimes White Feather wants to shake her. Those people tore apart our lives. How do we forgive that? White Feather presses her lips together, says nothing. Her sister's cheeks have filled out again. The purple shadows beneath her eyes are gone. And today, the cool breeze off the river feels delicious. A gull shrieks, then repeats itself three times. The girls in the river shout their fun, screech, shout again. Now the gull hangs in air, and White Feather, too, feels suspended, watching, listening, a little apart from all the rest. She's suspicious of happiness, the way it sneaks up unnoticed, the way it threatens sometimes to carry her away too. Um, I'm going to read one more poem. It's called Three Kinds of Religion. Most of the uh, Ganawaki Mohawks were nominally Catholics. They attended the uh, mission church but they also continued their native spiritual practices. And um, as when Joanna was growing up in Deerfield, um, Catholics were looked upon as like the devil, um, very, very suspiciously. So she's been exposed to a number of different spiritual practices, three kinds of religion. When White Feather was a white girl, a Puritan, Religion was one man thundering warnings, urging watchfulness. It was devils and witches and wicked ways that can grab a person up if she's not careful. It was a single God, a frightening God, a male God. And it was reading scriptures, saying prayers, and obeying, always obeying the rules men say were spoke by God. When she's in the mission church, Religion is called Catholic, and it is people singing. It's light through the windows and some words in the language called Latin. It's angels and a God who had a son who was also God, and a ghost is in there somewhere. It's confessing bad thoughts and saying Hail Marys and looking at the cross so as to remember that suffering is goodness. 
But in white feathers, sinful heart, suffering is the opposite of goodness. There's some kind of holiness in this place, though. The miracle that saved her brother when he was near death, that happened in this church. When she's in the woods, religion is a blackbird calling. It's sister trees, wild winds, little blue moths that skip over weeds down by the river, each with their own spirit. What is prayer but thankfulness for ancestors and animals, for morning sun? In this religion, spirit animals guide you. The singing comes from whippoorwills, from beetles clicking in tree bark and leaves rustling in wind from the soft chatter of raindrops. Um, the mention in that poem of her brother being near death and being saved by a miracle is part of the story, it's in the book. It's also part of the historical record of her brother having um, smallpox and a miracle occurring that saved him. And that's all I'm going to read. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Wonderful, engaging, engaging story. How, well, I want to open up to everyone to please put some questions in the chat. But I, I have a question. How long did it take to research that, Ginny? I mean, and, and, and how did you get started researching it? Um, well, I had heard about this particular raid, which was pretty infamous, I guess you, you might say. And I was thinking about um, the cultural shift that some of these children who were adopted into a totally different culture had to make, and it seemed to do so with success. Um, and I had read a little bit about um, the daughter of the minister, Eunice Williams, who was another child who was taken in the same raid and adopted by the same group. And when her father was eventually released, um, he made several attempts to get her back and her adoptive family wouldn't give her up and she didn't really want to leave. And I just found that to be interesting. So I went to Deerfield um, and did some research there. And I went to Ganawaki, which is still a community in Canada and um, took a tour with a person who lived there. Um, and I did some research online and uh, I just got, there are some books out there. Um, Reverend Williams survived it. His wife did not, um, but he did some writing about it. There's some writing about Joseph, um, Joanna's brother, who eventually returned to the colonies um, as a young adult. He also served as a translator for a group of explorers that went as far west as the Mississippi River. And he was thought to be the first uh, European, person of European descent who got that far. Um, so there's some interesting things I found out, but I had to imagine quite a bit too. There's more written about the white, Deerfield inhabitants than about the Mohawks. So a lot of it was just imagining what it might have been like. Wonderful job. You really bring, you really definitely bring that white feather, um, you know, her trials and tribulations and her, her victories to life. Beautiful, beautiful work. So thank you. Um, so yeah, please put questions in the chat. I know Karen Warinsky had a question uh, and I'll open it up to the three poets. Um, let's see, let me just open up the chat here. She wrote, hold on one second. Um, for those who have published a chat, chat book, um, besides winning a contest, where are the best places to submit shorter works uh, with a theme? Rather than, I assume, rather than just individual poems. Um, any suggestions there from any of you? Well, I'll yep. just say that Ginny Lo Connors runs a press and you can submit your chapbook to her contest. So why wouldn't you do that? Uh, Grace and Books. And uh, I, I was a, a judge for the chapbook contest one year and I could tell you it is like super fun.
to just read all the different things that come in from all over the country. People's imaginations just run riot and, um, and it's really a gift. So there are a lot of contests out there. It, they're not easy, obviously, to, uh, to win a contest, but, um, but you can find them. Um, if you look on the internet, you can find lots and lots of different contests for chapbooks. You can check Poets and Writers, which is a, a magazine for, for writers. And they tend to also advertise a lot of uh, contests and opportunities. The Grayson Books chapbook, annual chapbook contest is going on now. Uh, we get a different judge every year. Um, and we do, we get really interesting um, works. We don't publish a lot of chapbooks outside of that contest. Um, they, I like chapbooks a lot because you can read a chapbook in one sitting. They're nice to carry around. Um, and they're also a nice introduction for people just starting to get past public publishing single poems into volumes. But they don't sell really well. So as a publisher, we're not eager to publish a lot of them. But um, yeah, I like the chapbooks that we put out in our, through our contest. So they're, they're always interesting. Dan, I mean, you had just had success with the chapbook publication too. Um, but but mostly contests, um, yeah. Um, which you know, this, that's that's just how um, presses have to do it nowadays, just because you know the, the, it's so hard to get funding any other way. Um, so unless I sort I sort of feel like as a um, l like like in all fairness, I, I don't buy a lot of chapbooks. Right, so I'm not supporting press's production of them that way. So I just have to come across with the contest fees. Do you, you know what I mean? Like one way or another, you've got to be a, a citizen. So, so I, I just think that's sort of the yeah, yeah. And just as as a note from me, Karen and other folks who might be interested, the the, the not to keep a, a shameless plug here, but on Sunday we'll go over a lot of the resources that are available for finding out what's being looked for where. And there are a lot of pub, uh, publications or publishing houses that accept chapbooks year round. So I hope you can join us for that. It's, it's some great resources online. It's pretty cool stuff. So um, are there any other, let me just see if there are any questions. Yeah, someone just said there's so much competition. Uh, yeah, definitely so much competition. Um, I had a question for, for Christine. I know, Part of your bio said that you had have written a, a um, like a guide for people in twelve step programs. Can you talk a little bit about how what role poetry can play in recovery? Thank you for asking. Thank you so much for asking. This is my heart's work, and I'm so lucky to have lived long enough to have gone out of the college classroom and into the twelve step classroom. And that's no slam on the college classroom. Ben is still there. Uh, and uh, doing a really wonderful job of it. But I am in 12-step recovery. Um, I have 18 years in AA, and I also am a member of Adult Children of Alcoholics, which is uh, for people like me who grew up in a family with uh, alcoholic parents. And so every Friday morning, uh, I, uh, I lead a meeting of people in 12-step recovery who come and listen to a prompt, a poem that I've written. And, um, and I've come to realize it doesn't really matter what poem I give them. I mean, Yes, it's a spark, uh, but it's not as if people go, oh my gosh, this is an assignment. I have to do exactly what she's asking me to do. Uh, what happens is just a remarkable, remarkable thing, is that people who are, who are uh, dying to be heard, who really, really need to have their, um, their wounds and their, and their uncertainties and their sadness and their grief heard, uh, but who also want to turn it into art, that's a remarkable thing. And I'm just so lucky that I get to, you know, be the little uh, guide on the side for people in 12-step recovery. So that's the work that I do today. And the book itself is almost, uh, in a way, it's a, a story of my own recovery in poetry as well as prose. And then after each poem, there's a prompt. And as I say, it's, an, it's, a, it's a spark, not an assignment. Uh, so there's a prompt. And then I also ask people to um, respond lovingly. And so for those of you who've been through a workshop and gotten clobbered, uh, and it's probably happened to every single person that's listening this evening, that you've been in a workshop and someone has either misunderstood your word, work, or been uh, very dismissive in one way or another, this is a very loving group. 
and we respond in loving ways. And again, that's something people long for. So uh, that's how it happened. That's how it came about. Uh, it's called Beneath the Steps. It's available on Amazon if you're interested. And uh, yeah, just welcome anybody who wants to do further work. We also meet um, every other Sunday afternoon. And um, online, Christine? Or so online, uh, I'll drop my email in chat. Feel free to give me a call. That would be great. Um, and then, Ben, I mean, in following on what Christine said, where you know, poetry can play a huge role in recovery. Also, clearly, it played a big role in processing your grief. Would you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, no, it 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 it, it did. I, I, I just, uh, Christine, what you just said struck me as really moving. Um, I just want to say it, it's you hear things like that, and you think, God, wh wh why am I spending time in the classroom when when <laughs> when poetry in the when poetry can do so much in the world in other places where it doesn't always get a chance to yeah um but yeah no it it it, it does help process grief too maybe it's a little similar to what christine was saying in that um right i i had this teacher um cynthia mcdonald who who died she was a wonderful poet and wonderful teacher and she used to say the only sad poems are the ones that don't get written um you know that that if, if you can turn your grief into anything that you know that there, you know, there's a, a kind of um, not only is it outside of you for a moment, but but there's a small feeling of something to go along with the grief of of just having made something. Um, yeah, so I can I can imagine that you, you know uh, William Carlos Williams has has that quote. Uh, you know, um, it's very hard to get the news from poems, but people die miserably every day for a lack of what is found there, and it's sort of a beautiful quote and. For many years when I heard it, I assumed he meant, well, we should all be reading more poetry. But of late, I think, no, you can get what is found there by writing poetry. You know? You can, you, yeah, you can do it that way, too. Or you, in combination. Like, or in combination, like, yeah. Yeah, you, like, don't, and you don't have to be William Cross Williams to do it. You can be, right. you, can be you know, Ben Schmo or anybody. Yeah. <laughs> I love, I mean, I know the National Association of Poetry Therapy often uses a poem as a prompt. You know, you read a poem and then the prompt uses, is used to stimulate um, the response in poetry or prose. So yeah, yeah it's great when they, when they work in combination. It's wonderful too, so good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, if there aren't any other questions from the audience, I don't see anything in the chat, but um, I wanted to mention that our next Reading will be on February 1st. Two of our five uh, poets are here tonight. Um, we, we will have, let's see, Jack Powers from the Southwestern Quadrant, Gemma Mathewson from the Southeast, Claudia McGee, who is here this evening from the Northeast, uh, Laura Maza Dixon, also here this evening from the Northwest, and Garrett Phelan from the, from the Central um, Hartford area. So please join us uh, on February 1st, 7 o'clock on Zoom. And, uh, and I thank you all for coming and I'll hand it back over to Lucy. And thank you poets so much. And thank you, thank you, Richfield Library. Thank you for thank hosting, you for Barbara. Coming. Thank you. Thank you, Barb, as always. You're wonderful. Good night, everyone.